But in the last year and a half, I've seen a real turnaround. Uh, I've been asked to speak to the board of the Sierra Club. Uh, Sierra Club is investing a lot more now in uh, children and nature. Some of it they're investing in this children and nature network that was mentioned. Uh, uh, National Wildlife Federation, which has always been dedicated to this issue, uh, asked me to come back uh, when they f saw the galleys of the book almost two years ago. And they said that it was helping them in their soul searching as an institution. They had realized that they, that Ranger Rick is great, but it's still secondary experience. And they had to figure out how to get kids directly engaged with nature. And they've been working on that with the, the Green Hour program and others. Uh, the Trust for Public Land is moving in this direction. Many of the large environmental organizations have realized that they've done a good job of recruiting members. I'm sorry, they've done a good job of raising money, but they've done a lousy job of raising new members. If you look at their membership, they look a lot like me. Uh, they're aging, they're kind of like newspaper readers. Again, where are they gonna get their members in the future? Um, the Outdoor Industry Association had me give the keynote last year to one of their two major meetings that they have every year. They're concerned, they're looking at their numbers and they're seeing, this is the REIs, et cetera, they're, they're seeing their uh, sales healthy in terms of high-end yuppie and baby boomer gear that tends to stay in the, in the garage. But what they're seeing at the same time, though, is a dramatic fall in the uh, uh, sales of entry-level gear, outdoor equipment, to the extent that some of these companies have stopped making it, which, of course, is self-fulfilling. They're asking, where, will there be an outdoor industry as we know it in 10 or 15 years? Uh, I was recently in Canada. This movement uh, uh, has now spread to Canada, and I was recently there, and the head of, and I can never remember the name of this company. I've got to, I've got to imprint that. Um, it's the largest uh, seller of outdoor equipment in Canada, and it's like REI. It's equivalent to that. It's a co-op like REI is. In Canada, they have four million members. The head of that told me, and he'd been at this event uh, at the, uh, in Salt Lake that I spoke at. He said that they are so concerned that one of the things that they are seriously considering, I think they're going to do it as a company, as a co-op, is that they're going to start renting for free uh, outdoor equipment to, to the kids of all their members. That's a major commitment. It's also smart marketing if you want new members. But very concerned about the future of, of his industry. Um, let me back up for a little bit and just talk about the experience that many of us share that is at the root of this in our experience. Many of you look about my age. A lot of you look younger. Two or three look older. Um, <laughs> when I was a boy, I grew up, as I said, on the edge of Kansas City in Raytown, Missouri. It was the ticky tacky boxes uh, suburb, and uh, I could go out my back door as an eight-year-old through the yard, through the hedge, into the cornfield where my underground fort was, and then beyond that into the woods and the farms that seemed to go on forever. I spent most of my childhood in those woods. I owned those woods. They were my woods, and you remember, many of you, what that felt like. I owned them so much that I pulled out, I think, hundreds of survey stakes that I knew had something to do <laughs> with the bulldozers. <laughs> so how many here pulled out survey stakes? Look at this. Isn't this great? This is a, see, Science teachers, you know, we have to, <laughs> this has to be required, I think. Uh, um, uh, you are hereby inducted into the secret society of stake pullers. In fact, 
you are stakeholders in that society. Um, I had that, that great sense of ownership of that land, of those woods. They were in my heart. They are in my heart today. I go to them sometimes for strength today, even though they were bulldozed long ago. Many of you became science teachers, I think, because you had a special place. Maybe a woods, maybe some fields, maybe next to a stream, maybe a beach. And that place is still in you today, and you go to it sometimes for strength. The real question is, will future generations have that place to go to in their heart? I couldn't have told you anything, though, as an eight-year-old about global warming. Of course, we didn't know it then, but I couldn't have told you about the Amazon rainforest. I had no clue that my woods were connected ecologically to other woods. Education today is doing a wonderful job teaching kids about that. My profession of the news media is doing a good job teaching people about the big, a fairly good job, t teaching people about the big ecological issues. So kids today can tell you a lot about the Amazon rainforest, but as you know, many times they cannot tell you about the last time they went out and just watched the leaves move. There's an important issue here that goes beyond learning facts about nature, way beyond. I mean, how many of you remember when you were three or four, maybe crawling out the backyard, maybe into the trees at the edge of your yard, and finding a rock, and turning over that rock, and finding that you were not alone in the universe? <laughs> and that sense of awe and wonder that you felt listening to wind in the trees. Wonder is the most important word in this book, in this issue. Another important aspect of this is the full use of the senses. Other than maybe a New York subway, how often do we use all of our senses at the same time? <laughs> at the same time, important distinction. All of our senses, you don't do that looking at a screen. I look at screens a lot. I love my Macintosh, but I don't use all of my senses when I'm doing that. But I do when I go out and I go fishing. You know, it just happens. The full use of the senses and a sense of wonder are the absolute necessities for learning. And to the extent that we cut off kids from that, we cut them off from learning. One of the things that has impressed me is, and surprised me is the amount of support for this book that I've received from many figures in religion of different kinds of religion. I thought that I would have a problem with that with some sectors because there are folks, and I respect their view, I don't really agree with it, but I respect it, who worry that somebody like me or you is gonna come in and say to their kids, you need to worship nature. Uh, I've gotten none of that response that I worried about, and I was very careful with this, the chapter on the spiritual necessity of nature for children. I was very careful. Still, I worried, but I've gotten In fact, one of the first champions of the book was the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I think I've learned that uh, smart religious people, whatever religion, understand that all spiritual life begins with a sense of wonder. And where is one of the first windows into wonder? How can we shut that window? How can we do that? And that's what we're doing with many kids. We need to begin to think in terms of comparative risk. And this is something perhaps in your science classes that you could, you could do some work with your kids on, not preaching to them about it, but Perhaps studies could be done by them in their own lives in terms of what are the real risks in their lives. Stranger danger is very low on the list of real risks. Uh, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not saying there isn't danger in uh, nature itself. Somewhere in my garage, and it's disappear it disappears from time to time depending on when I clean the garage last, but there is a jar, a fruit jar, with about that much formaldehyde in it. 
and this very pale and unhappy looking copperhead in it, a poisonous snake. And uh, I don't know where that came from. I don't have, a, I know it's from my childhood, but I don't have a memory of it. My best friend from junior high visited, in high school, visited recently. He says, oh yeah, I know where that came from. He says, and he described seeing me at the bottom of a hill, racing up the hill, my knees are bloody, my elbows are bloody, and I'm waving this live copperhead in the, <laughs> in the air. And, I, and he said, you look so happy. <laughs> so I'm, yes, there are risks. But, you know, I, I try to remind uh, parents that uh, the, uh, the, the most poisonous spider in North America lives in their closets. And I did some research on the brown recluse. One of the things I learned is one of its favorite places to hide is in the pile of clothes and jeans on the floor. <clears throat> I tried that on my sons. <laughs> Didn't work. Um, We need to think in terms of comparative risk. Yes, there is risk outdoors, but there is also a great risk in raising a generation under virtual house arrest. Risk psychologically, risk to their sense of efficacy, of their